don't have no regards or respect for refs, and I think they all should be exterminated. What is American gangster about? They're them American refs. Rafael and Alpo and Nicky Balls and Terry Bull. Man, them refs. Blendon was always a very nice man. He was actually very soft-spoken. Um, he wasn't very, he wasn't a lot, about a lot of bling. He was very intelligent. He was formally educated. I was 13, and on the weekends, I would go and count money for my uncle. I asked him, well, what's this all for? And he kind of filled me in on that their families were very prominent in the government in Nicaragua. And when the Sandinistas came in, they were ousted. There was a counter-revolution, which was sponsored by the United States. Reagan was in power, and Reagan was anti-communist. They are counter-revolutionary, and God bless them for being that way. And I guess that makes them Contras, and so it makes me a Contra, too. They had to support themselves. And how did they support themselves? Drugs into the U.S. They basically were supporting the Contras and not trafficking in drugs because that was a cool thing to do or because that was their childhood dream, but because they were patriots. They wanted their country back and for no other reason. However, later on in the picture, you teach a man to fish, and he just might practice his trade. Today, federal agents seized over 400 pounds of coke. Agents say it's the largest haul ever seized on the West Coast. FBI came in, uh, we got busted. It just came and figured to my mind I had $65,000 next to my night tables. The money actually was to contrast. was called back to the federal building and they say, well, we are uh, going to give you your money back. I think the government didn't want to actually deal with it. He said, he's getting into the black thing down in L.A. And the guy up in San Francisco said, what are you talking about? And he said, you know, we're selling it to the blacks. He said, you go into these neighborhoods, you, there's no cops. You can sell it where you want. And when they start killing each other, nobody cares. And that was his method for success. That and the fact that he met this kid, Rick Freeway Ricky Ross, who lived in South Central, who knew the neighborhood, who knew the gangs, who knew the distribution system. You know, that's why it happened that way. Blandone, uh, Danilo Blandone, who was a person who was a member of the aristocracy of Nicaragua before the fall of Somoza, and then he fled and comes to the United States and decides while he's in the United States, so you can all understand this, he wants to raise money for the revolutionaries who are trying to overthrow the government to just overthrow them. So here in the United States, they try to do fundraisers and that doesn't work, and then Blandone gets a scheme, well, I can get some cocaine cheaply with some help from some of my friends and get it into the United States of America, all I need to find is somebody who can sell it. So they find a gentleman by the name of Rick Ross, who is Freeway Rick. Rick Ross comes in and starts selling cocaine at the terms beginning one or two grams. And within weeks, two, three, four kilos a week. Within months, what was it? 10 to 15 kilos a day. 
Ricky Ross was selling cocaine to the point of making three to four million dollars a day. He sold so much cocaine, it hurt his fingers to count the money. Not only in Los Angeles, but in Cincinnati, in St. Louis, all the way across America. So some can say, and this is the reason why people are so angry at you in your article, is that Ricky Ross, the dope dealer, was supplied by the CIA because Blandone was an operative for the CIA. I don't like they're, they're, they pay cash, right? They pay cash. They came and they got me and they said, come on, let's go for a ride. So we go for a ride. We're just talking. He's telling me about how better it's going to be. You know, it's, it's going to be good business. And I know I heard all about you. I heard you guys are good people and you're not going to do nothing wrong. And uh, I can take care of everything. I can make it happen. I can get the price. I can get as much as you want. And uh, we're going to have a good relationship. I knew he was the man. Because, you know, like when, when we first would do the deal, we would do a deal and then he would be parked, you know, down the streets. We would be on the other side of the street. And, you know, he would, you know, give us the wave. Hey, buddy, you know, like that there. Everything's good. Danilo took me to an apartment, and he said, well, this is what we're going to be doing at business at, you know, and told me all the prices and everything. Well, the price went down. I think the price went down substantially that day, you know. Maybe increased me, like, where I could make another 20, 30,000 a day. I could get the drugs from Danilo Blandon, and 45 minutes, it's all gone. I was going through, like, a million dollars worth of drugs just about every day. He was a teacher, you know, in, in, in a lot of respects. He, he was a father figure in some respects. We looked at it as, as almost family. Man, I didn't even understand what a contra was, you know what I'm saying? I didn't even know what Nicaragua was. Nor did I care. You know, the only thing that I cared about was, you know, have my drugs on time, price gonna be right. We had heard that Freeway Rick was getting his dope from a very main or big operator, a guy named Danilo Blando. This guy is delivering to South Central, and he had 13 locations. 13 locations at one time is a very big deal. So it was a big operation. We get to the house, Ron Lester's house, and we knock on the door, and he says, yeah, I know who you are. I work for the CIA, and you're not supposed to be here. I said, well, can we talk inside? We're searching through it, and we're finding all this military information, you know, laws, rocket launchers, different weapons. I grabbed as much as I could as far as information. It looked important, so I took it. There was no drugs in the house. There was no reason to take them. When we all got back to the station, everybody's waiting for the crew that's going to come in and say, hey, we got 100 kilos. Everybody shows up empty-handed. The same story from everybody else is that we got burned. Somebody burned us. The only place where there was dope was at Danilo Blandon's house, and it was a gram of coke. They arrested Danilo. The following day, one of the guys in, in the office said, hey, the feds were down here yesterday and took everything that you seized at the house. I said, well, you know what? I think we're into something that's bigger than us, something we really can't deal with. This nation cannot abide the communization of Central America. We cannot have Soviet bases on the mainland of this hemisphere. And I still, to this day, Council, don't see anything wrong with taking the Ayatollah's money and sending it to support the Nicaraguan freedom fighters. As long as there is breath in this body, I will speak and work, strive and struggle for the cause of the Nicaraguan freedom fighters. Danilo was let go. His name is Ricky Ross, the most elusive of the new gang godfathers, a mystery man. He's wanted in a handful of states across this nation for dealing massive amounts of cocaine, but he's been forced to run his organization while on the lam.
Blandon really called him. I was in the car when Blandon called him. They talked and he was like, oh, I'm home, I came home. And he asked Rick, I want to see you. I have some stuff I talk about, want to talk about. Rick accepted him. He came down there and talked. Like, man, I told Rick that he was in some financial trouble. Like, this is how you get Rick the hooked on the stuff. Like, I'm some financial trouble. I need some help. And, you know, I got these, you know, I got some work. And Rick, like, nah, nah, I ain't messing with no work. And, but he convinced him. And he convinced me in a way, you know, because I was there. And Rick was like, I ain't got no money, but my partner probably didn't want to do something. That's how this, that's how this happened. And I'm like, I don't know, man, I'm done with that shit. No, then he told Rick, like, you know, man, I, you like my son. He said that, I'm listening to him. He said, you know, you like my son. Just this one time, Rick, you know, I let you get, if you come out there, if you come to uh, Mexico, I give them to you for seven, like seven to buy. But if I cross, you got to give me 10. And like, 10? Like, shit, seven, no, I'm not going to Mexico to get this shit. 100 kilos of 10,000 a key, a million dollars. So I ended up putting that money in there, and we went to go see him. So we finally see them in a Blandon. Uh, I'm seeing him and the dude pulling up, like in a Camaro or something. I said, Rick, that'll go right there. Like, but I'm seeing this dude, like, fake, like he's sleeping next to us, too. Like, all right. I'm looking around and I'm like, damn. So the dude, when Blandon walked up to us and the other guy, the, the DEA, they stood away and they said, you got the money, Dr. Rick? And now this time I'm thinking like, nah, I ain't giving you my, I ain't giving up the money before I see this shit. I'm like, nah. And then they said, no, no, it's parked around the corner. I'm arguing with Rick, like, Rick, man, you sure, man, this some shit don't, this don't seem right. So I'm like, you sure? Like, nah, nah, I'll take you like, you know, like my father, he's cool. And then Blandon came back to the car and so this other guy that was our driver, I said, go look him and make sure it's in there. So Rick and him went to go see what's in there. So Rick waved his hand to me like, yeah, it's in there, they're in there, honey key. So I gave him the money. I gave Blando the money, bam. As soon as I gave him the money, that's when I seen like jackets and shit, DEA, FBI, helicopters coming off the roof. The truck that was had the book work in it has a cutoff switch so it never rolled. By this time, Rick had got back in the other truck. So Rick taking off. So when Rick moving, I'm I'm going this way. And I see them jackets and then all you can hear is freeze. And I see Rick take off. Rick take off going towards the freeway and see so hit the tree. I'm about to go through the mall, but it was like man, about 50 red beams to my head. Like, shut up, you know, got the truck, got the truck, DEA, DEA. Like, oh, shit. Like, like, so by this time, I'm rested, but I see Blandon. I'm looking at him, giving him high five. I'm like, oh, this is fucked up. I'm like, you know, he giving the uh, DA and all them high five. I'm like, oh, this is, this is what it is. It's cold setup. Like, that's, that's exactly how this shit happened, man. It's cold defendant, and you guys wrote a, you guys wrote a declaration to our, to my judge saying it wasn't no involvement. How could you say there's no involvement if an investigation ain't over? Me and Ricky Ross is waiting to get sentenced Tuesday. And she got, what, what, what a judge gonna say to us come Tuesday? The question which was asked of us by the judge was, was Ricky Ross ever a agent or a contract employee? I was in court, I, I'd be in court every time there's a ruling and everything because I'm part of it. And the judge asked the prosecutor to get a written statement from you saying there wasn't no involvement. You guys wrote a letter saying there's no involvement. Then you come up here and say, we, it's still going on. So come Sorry. Tuesday, the judge gonna tell me, oh, it was, it was no involvement. You get 20 years, Rick, get life. I wanna be very clear. The judge asked for an affidavit from the Central Intelligence Agency whether any one of five individuals by name had ever had any association with the Central Intelligence Agency. Let me, please let me finish. First of all, we answered that question. The pub, it's a public available answer. The record of that affidavit is available. Anybody wants to see it. And we found that none of the five named individuals had never been, had ever had any association with the Central Intelligence Agency. On that declaration, it said, no, when Manessa was, and you guys knew that he was involved 20 years ago. You, and, it, and the declaration said he was a digger wagon in mafia. You guys knew he was selling drugs, but you didn't arrest him. You guys arrest him for one kilo and go, and then gonna say me and Rick was had a hundred kilos and, and didn't even have no cocaine. And he get five years, Rick looking at life. My first offense, I'm looking at 20. And he he's on his way out. And 
Vlad Dome is out of jail and you paid him $166,000. judge put in the CIA was whether Blando or any one of four other individuals were ever associated with the CIA. That question was answered. The answer is a matter of public record. It is absolutely the case that Blando was an informant for the DEA. That is a question, though, that which the DEA is answering, not a question which asks the CIA. Whatever we were running in LA, it goes, the profit is, it was going to the counter revolution. State sentencing guidelines and the federal sentencing system uh, rewards those who get others involved in criminal conduct, and that's what Blandone did. Wayne came to me, was in need, and I broke weak. That's all I did. And I was duped. The race ain't over yet. Well, does, I guess, does the black community need a hero who's doing life in a maximum security penitentiary? The government can't stop it. It has to come from somebody that's been there, somebody that understands the problem. You're not operating on the assumption that you're going to get out of here anytime soon. All these big pie in the My sky. It's America. We can dream. One thing they didn't take from you. They didn't say you can't dream no more. Prosecutor said is that if Danilo Blandon wanted to make a deal, he was gonna have to bring the moon. What was he caught with? Ten thousand kilos. Yeah, I think he got out four or five days after me. Uh, well, the only person who named on the letter that that they took to the judge was my name. Uh, we felt they misled the judge uh, in the letter. Uh, the letter went something like, we want to let Mr. Blandon out so he can reestablish his relationship with Mr. Ross, who is a large crack cocaine dealer in the Los Angeles area. In tonight's Eye on America, accusations underscore the word accusations that are nothing short of explosive. They are that the CIA knowingly and intentionally did what amount to pump crack cocaine into Los Angeles to help fund rebels in Nicaragua to make somebody pay for what they have done to my community and to my people. There were some strong emotions vented today in Los Angeles as anger increases over a disturbing allegation that in the 1980s, the CIA knowingly permitted black neighborhoods to be flooded with crack cocaine. I mean, the way we was getting the drugs in, it had to, this guy had to have some powerful people behind him. It doesn't make any difference whether they delivered the kilo themselves or they turn their heads while somebody else delivered it, they're just as guilty. The other thing was, he and Flandeau were friends. I mean, they were very good friends for a number of years. And Rick was telling me about how when Blandone moved to Miami, he would go to Miami and see him, and he'd bring his daughter's rap records uh, from L.A., and he'd drive his kids to school, and he'd have dinner at the house. I mean, I went to his house and ate. You know, I stayed at his house before, you know, several times. Blandone and Manessis were working for an army that was a wholly owned subsidiary of the CIA. They were meeting with CIA agents. Blandone, and, and, and this came out in court. I mean, Danilo Blandone is now a government witness. He works for the Drug Enforcement Administration. And we've paid him, I don't know, $166,000 over the last 18 months because he's such a good informant. So they put him on the witness stand in Ricky Ross's case. And he testified that in 1981, he went to Honduras. He met with the commander, the military commander of the, of the CIA's army. And he was instructed to go, set, to go raise money in California for this Contra army. And, and he was told that the ends justified the means. And those ends being sell cocaine if well, you have to. Well, look, he was in, he was in the room with the Nicaraguan representative of the Cali cartel, Mr. Manessis, and he was in the room with a government marketing expert named Danilo Blandon. Now, if they weren't talking about selling cocaine, I don't know what they were talking about. Here. Here's a guy who is obviously a CIA operative, Mr. Mm -hmm. Blandon, who is working with this, this government-backed army that we've kind of created in Nicaragua. But how the heck does this guy get to bring in tons of cocaine? I said ton I'm talking tons. 
three, four, five, six, seven, eight tons of cocaine weekly in the United States of America for seven years, and no one can ever catch him. Well, number one, Mr. Meneses was actually indicted in 1984. He was known within uh, my own sources in DEA told me he was known as a, El Jle de la Droga, the king of drugs. Uh, he was in more than 40 files and indicted mysteriously, and people within DEA say that it was CIA intervention that kept this sealed indictment from ever being opened. So he was well known. He was well known. The, the connection between him, Blandon, and uh, uh, Calero, who was the head of the Nicaraguan government in exile, is clear. There's a clear evidentiary. Well, we got a picture of. Him. Yeah, there's a there's a clear evidentiary trail. Now,